Psalm chapter 20, verse 7 and 8. Let us try to read together loud and clear. Verse 7. Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and have fallen, but we have risen and stood upright. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, your word is light to us, O Lord. It shows us the way and what to do, how to follow your way, how to follow Christ. Lord, as we open the scripture, speak to our hearts today, O Lord. On this special day, we ask your help to come visit our hearts. O oh Lord, help us to understand these two verses and speak to us through these verses, O oh Lord, to each one of us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Trusting in chariots and horses. That's the message title today. Trusting in chariots and horses. If you see that picture, somebody is boastfully walking on that military base. Generally, countries are boastful of their military strength, how much power we have. Even in the olden days, the kings, they show their power, they, they display their strength based on their military base how many soldiers they have, how many chariots they have, how many war horses that they have that shows their strength. In 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 27, we see the entire country is filled with soldiers, military. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 27, the sons of Israel were mustered and were provisioned and went to meet them, and the sons of Israel camped before them like two little flocks of goats. But the Arameans filled the country. You see? You see the military base of the, this Arameans? They fill the country. That means if you stand at one side and if you see the other end, all you see is soldiers. All you see is people. So that means that these people are provoking people or educating or brain, uh, changing their thought process and brain and bringing all the people to the war. Maybe 10 years and up, maybe 16 years and up. They fill the whole country with the military base, soldiers. But if you see Israel here, they were like two little small flock. <clears throat> the first thing is they depend or their strength depend upon the soldiers, number of soldiers. The second point is the number of chariots that they have. Last week I spoke about chariots. How they decorate their chariots. They put their idol symbols. And some chariots which is uh, technologically advanced chariots they have uh, attached uh, circular weapons. They keep on rotating. That means if somebody wants to kill the person who is on the chariot, they cannot even approach the chariot. Because of that, it kills them, it sweeps, sweeps them. Technologically advanced chariots, they boast about that. And also they boast about the war horses, number of war horses. They're separate, they're different from normal horses. These war horses are trained uh, horses. They, they're not afraid of war. If the enemy is coming, they go forward. A person may turn back and go backward, but these trained war horses Go forward. At the trumpet sound, they just march forward. Aha, they say. Job says, aha. 
They're not afraid. They're not fearful. They laugh at war. Job chapter 39. This is what God speaks to Job. Job chapter 39, verse 19 onwards. This is what God is saying to Job. Do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a mane? Do you make him leap like a locust? His magic snoring snort, snort is terrible. He passed in the valleys. He means that horse, war horse. He passed in the valley he re and rejoices in his strength. He goes out to meet the weapons. He's not afraid. He la laughs at fear and is not dismayed. And he does not turn back from the sword. The quiver rattles against him. The flashing spear and javelin. With shaking and rage, he races over the ground. And he doesn't stand still at the voice of the trumpet. As often as the trumpet sounds, he says, Aha! Uh -huh, and he sends the battle from afar. And the thunder of the captains and the war cry. These are well-prepared war horses. This is how the kings, they display their strength by the number of soldiers on military basis. They educate them. They change their mind. They bring a lot of people to the war. That is what we see in ISIS today, Muslims. They change their thinking process. It is very hard for us to bring them back from that mindset. They prepare them for the battle. You must work for the king. You must work for the country. You must kill the enemy. They are, they are our enemies. You must kill them. This is what they do. They provoke them. In Bible, I want to show a king who displays his military base. Your friend, Pharaoh. All bad people are your friends. All good people are my friends. <laughs> David is my friend. I'm just joking. Somebody said, Anu, when you say something, <laughs> you say it as a joke, otherwise we take it as serious. Don't take it as serious. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> Exodus chapter 34. Sorry, 14. Exodus chapter 14. Verse 6 and 7. So he made his chariot ready and took his people with him, Pharaoh, and he took 600 select chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. 600 select chariots. That means choice chariots. The advanced chariots, like I, have, I was talking about. So those days, these Egyptians or these pharaoh used technologically advanced chariots. Like I heard in Nevada, we have Area 51. United States, this country is making uh, unique weapons, that's what I heard, to attack the opponents, to attack the enemy. So those days, they have a choices to chariots, like I have mentioned. So Pharaoh has brought 600 of them and the other chariots, maybe thousands. And it says officers on them. That means each chariot must be carrying at least three people. One is the sword bearer. Second one is the shield bearer. Third person is who is riding the chariot. Pharaoh took this incident as a very serious incident. When Israel people are leaving Egypt, this Pharaoh, along with his soldiers, he was following the Israelites to kill them. And he took a lot of chariots, a lot of horses, a lot of people in verse 6 it says, thousands and thousands of people were behind Israel. You may think very few people, but they are many. He is displaying his strength. At any cost, either I must kill these people and bring some back to Egypt. I have determined. I'm going to do it. I bring all that I have to persuade these people to come back. 
at that time, at that moment, something happens. When Pharaoh is displaying all his military, this is what we see in verse 19, beautiful. The angel of God, who had been going before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind. Who is that angel of God? Who is that angel of God? Jesus. Christ. It is called Christophany. Means Christ appearing in the Old Testament. In special occasions, Jesus Christ appeared in the Old Testament. As an angel of God. That means Jesus Christ himself. He knows that Pharaoh was behind him. The soldiers are behind them. He moved from forward all the way to the back. Like leading from the front and to protecting. Charles Pudgeon said, if you turn back, you see God. He's that close. That means God is protecting them, protecting them like this. If you just oh, you want to see God, just look back and you see God. That's how he's protecting his people. And he went on and saying, if God is not right in front of you, look back. Look back, you'll find. If sun is not shining in the east, that means he is shining in the west. Don't you think it is true, dear brothers and sisters? In our own life, in our own lives, we may complain, Lord, nothing is working out. Lord, the situation seems to be dark. Lord, you are not working. Just turn back and look what God has already done in our lives, dear brothers and sisters. What you find if you turn back? If I turn back, I find his mercy. I find his grace. That's what Spurgeon has said. I'm putting myself in the foot of Charles Spurgeon. I'm no different. When I turn back, I see graces all through the days of my life. Whatever I am today, it is by his grace. He shines like an afternoon sun in my life if I turn back. God has done in my life, and it is true even in your lives, dear brothers and sisters. If God is not working, if you don't see God in front, just turn back. You'll find thousands of mercies, thousands of graces, which had already God has given in your life. God was behind them and protecting. Now we see two powerful hands coming together. One is prideful Pharaoh and omnipotent God, almighty God. Then what happens in verse 28? The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Even Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after them, not even one of them remained. Just imagine the situation. Thousands and thousands of soldiers behind them. And these people are living with their animals and children and women and everybody. There must be a lot of crying. Babies must be crying. Women must be shouting. Men must be shouting and crying. And Moses called God, Lord. What happened? What happened? Out of, th out of those two mighty hands, who won that day? Word of God says, not even a single person was alive. All people got drowned in those waters under the mighty hand of God, dear brothers and sisters. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 31 says that the war horse may be prepared but the victory belongs to God. The war horse may be prepared, well prepared, but the victory is from the Lord. David has said, uh, David or someone, psalmist has said in Psalm 44 verse 6, I take my bow, I take my bow, I take my sword. They don't give me victory. They don't give me victory. God gives the victory. God is the one who fights our battle. How weak these Israelites at the moment when Pharaoh was following. There may be thousand people, ten thousands of people coming. 
But Israel has one, just one, Almighty God. He can fight the battles for them, dear brothers and sisters. We have a powerful God who works in your life and in my life, who can fight the battles of this life. I want to show three people where God displayed his power, apart from this, or three places, three scripture portions. One is Israel itself. This is the promise that God has given to Israel, Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1. Deuteronomy, please turn to Deuteronomy. It says, don't worry. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1. When you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, Lord your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt, is with you. Israel, the nation of Israel, was initially, they, they did not have any military base. They don't have huge soldiers. All their dependency is God and nothing but God. And that is what we see in the Old Testament. God is bringing them victory all the time. God is the one who fights for them. Second, Abraham. When I mention Abraham, we all have some pictorial thing in our brains. Abraham means like uh, a bearded, white beard, like a soft person, soft spoken. If you go, you get a blessing from him. That's what Abraham for us, right? Can you imagine Abraham becoming a soldier or a warrior to taking the sword and killing people? Can you imagine that? Bible says that he has done it. We have already gone through it when we went through Genesis series in the beginning. Genesis chapter 14 we see Abraham kills a king. You know how many kings? He captures them to bring Lot. Four kings. Abraham is not a teenage person or a young man at the moment. How could he do that? Abraham must be going, taking his sword and he must be with his uh, weak hand. He must be just doing it. He, all he wants is just cut the hand. But all of a sudden, it, it, it parts the body into two parts. How is it possible? Abraham must be wondering. The force, the lightning is behind him. That's God. How is it possible for Abraham, a simple man, to kill four kings. He became a warrior. How is that possible? That's what Melchizedek said in chapter 14 of Genesis. God is the one who gave the victory. Genesis chapter 14. Verse 19. Melchizedek blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Tell me, dear brothers and sisters, who brought the victory that day? It's God or Abraham? It's God or Israel? It's God or Moses? Repeatedly, consistently, in the Old Testament, we see God, 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 who fights the battles for us, for them. Another example that I want to give is David. It's too marvelous. David, it seems we have many children. You remember David Goliath's story? How David was, must be looking at Goliath and how Goliath must be looking at David. David, he's a small man. Goliath is a huge man, almost a double of his uh, height and shape, maybe five, six times of his shape. David must be looking like this to Goliath. How Goliath must be looking at David. Who won the day? What was Goliath was saying? It says Goliath was cursing David. What? What? What you got to say? You're a man or bird. I can't hear you. If you come to me, I'll tear to pieces and throw. He cursed you. You, you come to me, the stick. What is this stick? Little stick. What is that? What nonsense is that? There is no any other man 
Why do you send me this bird? I can't even see his mouth. Some noise comes. Who won the day? David and his God. See how marvelous it is. A small man killing Goliath. How is it possible for a simple man? He just took his sling and he threw. But the force went behind him. That's God. He fights our battles, dear brothers and sisters. Either you take it or don't take it. There is David in you. Either you accept or don't accept. There is Abraham in you. There is warrior in you. Don't you think we have times in our own lives, Lord, there is Goliath in my life. Don't you think, Lord, this is too much for me to fight against. Lord, I cannot handle it. Don't you have those moments, Goliath moments in your own life? Did not you see God coming out of your rescue and he fighting the battle for you in your own life? There is David in us. There is Abraham in us. God is with us. God is working for us. God is taking care of our battles, dear brothers and sisters. I read a story about a, about a war, Navy war in Scotland. All these uh, English people they were on the ocean, and the Spanish people were coming after them in that ocean. The country itself is at stake. The kingship itself is at stake in the times of Elizabeth uh, Queen I, I think. And the, all these people, they thought they are losing their country. They'll be losing this uh, Navy battle because of the huge, huge ships around them. And these people, these English people, they started praying. And they're, all of their country members, they started praying. And suddenly there was a wind, there was a storm, there was a great storm in the ocean. And it affected only those Spanish people and these people are saved. How is it possible? How is it possible? Not only in the times of uh, biblical, Old Testament biblical times, we see those kind of things happening even today in our own lives, dear brothers and sisters. They went. The English people went on the ships. They took their whatever tools that they need or the tanks that they need to fight against. They have not used any of them. Wait and see. First, First Samuel chapter, Exodus chapter 14, verse 13, I think. Wait and see the salvation of the Lord. All they have to do is just wait. They have not used their tools. God just helps. Sometimes we may have to use the tools like David used the sling. Sometimes we may have to use it. Sometimes we may not have not to use it. But God brings the victory. Like the psalmist said. I carry my bow. I carry my sword, but they don't give me victory. See, if you see complete thing, complete cycle in the Old Testament and even in our own lives, we see the hand of God is working with us. That means our efforts, our money, our talents, our knowledge, it's just there as a tools. They cannot bring us anything, dear brothers and sisters. So it's all about God. See, whatever we are today, whatever we have, how much protection we have, how much security we have, it is not based on the money. It is not based on, a, on anything. It's because of God working behind in our lives. Exodus chapter 14, verse 15, I think. 
uh, chapter, uh, Exodus chapter 15, verse 3, it says, Lord is a warrior. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says, God is love. See, both opposite. Opposite. Old Testament says that God is a warrior who fights for his people. And New Testament says, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, God is love. How is that possible? Is it contradictory? God is both. God is a warrior in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, even now. He fights those spiritual battles today, dear brothers and sisters. He fights those spiritual battles for us, or any battles that we have. So if I put all these things together, it doesn't matter how much we have, what we have. It's all about God, being with him, that's all. God is a warrior. God is our strength. God is our security. We doesn't believe in chariots. We doesn't believe in horses. We, do, we don't believe in money. It's all God. One of our grandfather, I have seen with my own eyes, he's a rich man, even 30 years ago. So he works for a bank and he made a lot of money. He doesn't believe in God. What he does is he brought a huge land in Dilshik Nagar, huge land. He constructed, you know, kind of a multiple buildings in that. It's like a small area to play. And then uh, first floor, huge floor and multiple portions to rent. And again, he saved his money. He put the second floor. And again, he saved his money and put the third floor, entire floor is for him. And, and behind that, there is another huge land, and he put small houses there. So what happened? One of his childhood friends said, let's do business. I want some uh, security from you. All you need to do is just sign, that's it. Some security, that's it. For one crore. So my grandfather signed that. Within three months, that man escaped. Now the bank came after this man, my grandfather. All his life savings, he was about to die at that moment. In his 70s, he is. He lost that. That's the only thing that he has. A lot of income from those portions. This happened several years ago, maybe 15, 20 years ago. All his life savings is gone. All his, his property is gone. Now the children suddenly came to the streets. Nothing to have. See, there is no security in the money. They cannot help us, dear brothers and sisters, in this life. God must be there in our life. Not only in this life. To go even to heaven, we need God. See, without knowing that, people try with their own efforts. If, the well is, if, if, uh, if there is a well and there's water, you get water for 50 foot, what happens if you put 10 foot pipe there? Do you think water will come? That is what people are doing with their own effort. I can buy salary. I can buy heaven. I'll do, I'll give the offerings. I'll help the poor people. I, 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 I will do, I'll put the 10 foot pipe which can never touch the water. You can never touch heaven, dear brothers and sisters. They cannot. How can you pull the ships in the ocean with horses? Is it possible? How can you pull the chariots with, with the wind? You need horse. To go to heaven, you need Jesus Christ, dear brothers and sisters. John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 6 says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. There is no other way. No one, it says, no one, take it, no one can come to heaven except the Lord Jesus Christ, dear brothers and sisters. If you think you will go to heaven, that's impossible without the Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one way. You need Jesus Christ. Society may tell a thousand things, a religion may say th hundreds of things that you can reach heaven with your own effort. You can do that. You can do, do this. Impossible. There is only one way. God came 2,000 years ago 
to this earth. 2021, right? 2021 years ago, Jesus Christ came and died for all of our sins to give that one way into heaven. If you have Jesus Christ, you'll go to heaven. If you don't, it's impossible. Because Bible says that there is only one way and that one way is the Lord Jesus Christ. You all are blessed, don't you? You have Jesus Christ. You have found your way, the Lord Jesus Christ. Or in fact, Jesus drawn you into that one way. Are you not glad, dear brothers and sisters? Some of you, are, many of you have born in Christian family. You don't have to struggle to come from other religion. You don't have to struggle. You don't have to do anything. Just go to church you say, along with your parents. That's it. You heard hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages. At one point of time, God convinced you and you have said, how easy, how easy God paved your way. You don't have, even have a struggle to come from other religions. How glad you should be, dear brothers and sisters. You have found your way, the Lord Jesus Christ. I persuade for those people who have not yet found the way, stop finding the way. You can never enter with your own effort, being good works. When heart is evil, how can you do good works and go to heaven? There is a problem in your heart itself that can never change unless Jesus comes in your heart. King James, it, is say, it says in Psalm 20, verse 7 and 8, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord. I don't say NASB is correct, but NASB says, we boast in the name of the Lord. Trusting and boasting, if I meditate correctly, it's different. Trusting is something you trust, you believe, you trust. There's somebody, something is there for you. Boasting is, I have something, you know what, I have this. That's what scripture says. That's what you and I must say, being a Christian, being boastful. I am saved. The Lord has saved me. I have done nothing, but yet he has saved me. That means when you go out and give the gospel, talk about Christ to other people, we must not be displaying the shyness. Do you know what Jesus Christ came? Or what does he think? No, Bible says the opposite. We must boast in the name of the Lord. Our hearts must be glad that you are saved. God has saved you. He fought the battle for you. So I want to remind in this word, as we live, let us not trust the chariots. Let us not trust the horses. Let us not trust our jobs and money our health. Split up a second, you may lose everything. Split up a second. Nothing is guaranteed. But if you are with God, dear brothers and sisters, I want to remind you, He will fight your battle. He will take care of you. Like we have seen the examples. Let's stand up and close with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, many a times, O oh Lord, we have trusted with our own ability, our talents, our knowledge. But we fail, O oh Lord. We understood that we cannot reach heavens with our merit. We need someone greater, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, many people in this Bay Area, Steve Jobs, millions and billions of dollars. He could not even save himself, his health. Lord, when he cannot buy his health with his money, can he buy heaven with our money? We cannot, Lord. Someone has to free us, give us freely. It must be free because we cannot, Lord, put a price on heaven. And, O oh Lord, when you came down, you have said, I am giving you the gift of salvation, and it's free. All you need to do is accept, and you'll be saved. 
the world calls Christian religion is a cheap religion, a low religion, a poor religion. But your heaven is at stake. People say hundred things. They insult us. They say a thousand of things. It doesn't matter. Ultimately, it is you who suffer in heaven. If you want to be in heaven, accept Christ today. Lord, as you have uh, given this word to us, as we have taken this, Lord, verses, help us not to forget. Help us to trust you all the time. When David came to you, when David was uh, facing Goliath, he never had a wavering faith, O Lord. We see his confidence. Today, Israel will see that there is God in Israel. Lord, help us to have such kind of boldness. Help us to be boastful of the work that you have done in our lives, O Lord. My Lord has done. My Lord has redeemed. My Lord has given me hope. Thank you for reminding us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.